Chapter 1, Language Learning in Early Childhood. In this chapter, we will look briefly at the language development of young children. We will then consider several explanations that have been offered for how language is learned. There is an immense amount of research on children on child language. Although much of this research has been done with middle class, North American, and European families, there is a rich body of cross-linguistic and cross-cultural research as well. Our purpose in this chapter is to touch on a few main points in this research, primarily as preparation for the discussion of second language acquisition, SLA, which is the focus of this book. First language acquisition. Language acquisition is one of the most impressive and fascinating aspects of human development. We listen with pleasure to the sounds made by a three-month-old baby. We laugh and answer the conversational ba 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 babbling of older babies, and we share in the pride and joy of parents whose one-year-old has uttered the first bye-bye. Indeed, learning a language is an amazing feat, one that has attracted the attention of linguists and psychologists for generations. How do children accomplish this? What enables a child not only to learn words, but also to put them together in meaningful sentences? What pushes children to go on developing complex grammatical language, even though their simple early communication is successful for most purposes? Does child language develop similarly around the world? How do bilingual children acquire more than one language? The first three years, milestones and developmental sequences. One remarkable thing about L1 acquisition is the high degree of similarity in the early language of children all over the world. Researchers have described developmental sequences for many aspects of L1 acquisition. The earliest vocalizations are simply the involuntary crying that babies do when they are hungry or uncomfortable. Soon, however, we hear the cooing and gurgling sounds of contented babies, lying in their beds and looking at the fascinating shapes and movement around them. Even though they have little control over the sounds they, they make in these early weeks of life, infants are able to hear subtle differences between the sounds of human languages. Not only do they distinguish the voice of their mother from those of other speakers, they also seem to recognize the language that was spoken around their mother before they were born. Furthermore, in cleverly designed experiments, researchers have demonstrated that tiny babies are capable of very fine auditory discrimination. For example, they can hear the difference between sounds as similar as pa and ba. Janet Worker, Patricia Cool, and others have used technologies that allow us to see how sensitive infants are to speech sounds. What may seem even more remarkable is that infants stop making distinctions between sounds that are not phonemic in the language that is spoken around them. For example, by the time they are a year old, babies who will become speakers of Arabic stop reacting to the differences between pa and ba, which is not phonemic in Arabic. Babies who regularly hear more than one language in their environment continue to respond to differences between these sounds. One important finding is that it is not enough for babies to hear language sounds from electronic devices. In order to learn or retain, the ability to distinguish between sounds, they need to interact with a human speaker. Whether they're becoming monolingual or bilingual children, however, it will be many months before their own vocalizations begin to reflect the characteristics of the language or languages they hear, and longer still before they connect language sounds with specific meaning. However, by the end of their first year, most babies understand quite a few frequently repeated words, in a language or languages spoken around them. They wave when someone says bye-bye, they clap when someone says pat a cake, they eagerly hurry to the kitchen when juice and cookies are mentioned. At 12 months, most babies will have begun to produce a word or two that everyone recognizes. By the age of two, most children reliably produce at least 50 different words, and some produce many more. About this time, they begin to combine words into simple sentences, such as, mommy juice, and baby fall down. These sentences are sometimes called telegraphic because they leave out such things as articles, prepositions, and auxiliary verbs. We recognize them as sentences because even though function words and grammatical morphemes are missing, the word order reflects the word order of the language they are hearing, and the combined words have a meaningful relationship that makes them more than just a list of words. Thus, for an English-speaking child, kiss baby does not mean the same thing as baby kiss. Remarkably, we also see evidence 
even in these early sentences, that children are doing more than imperfectly imitating what they have heard. Their two or three word sentences show signs that they can creatively combine words. For example, more outside may mean I want to go outside again. Depending on the situation, daddy uh-oh might mean daddy fell down or daddy dropped something or even daddy please do that funny thing where you pretend to drop me off your lap. As children progress to the discovery of language in their first three years, there are predictable patterns in the emergence and development of many features of the language they are learning. For some language features, these patterns have been described in terms of developmental sequences or stages. To some extent, these stages in language acquisition are related to children's cognitive development. For example, children do not use temporal adverbs such as tomorrow or last week until they develop some understanding of time. In other cases, the developmental sequence seems to reflect the gradual acquisition of the linguistic elements for expressing ideas that have been present in children's cognitive understanding for a long time. For example, children can distinguish between singular and plural long before they reliably add plural endings to nouns. Correct use of irregular plurals, such as feet, takes even more time and may not be completely under control until the school years. Grammatical morphemes. In the 1960s, several researchers focused on how children acquire grammatical morphemes in English. One of the best known studies was carried out by Roger Brown and his colleagues and students. In a longitudinal study of the language development of three children called Adam, Eve, and Sarah, they found that 14 grammatical morphemes were acquired in a similar sequence. The list below, adapted from Brown's 1973 book, shows some of the morphemes they studied. Present progressive, ing, mommy running, plural, s, two books, irregular past forms, baby went, possessive, s, daddy's hat, copula, mommy is happy, articles, the and a, regular past, ed words, she walked, third person singular simple present, s, she runs, auxiliary B, he is coming. Brown and his colleagues found that a child who has mastered the grammatical morphemes at the bottom of the list had also mastered those at the top, but the reverse was not true. Thus, there was evidence for a developmental sequence or order of acquisition. However, the children did not acquire the morphemes at the same age or rate. Eve had mastered nearly all the morphemes before she was two and a half years old, while Sarah and Adam were still working on them when they were three and a half or four. Brown's longitudinal work was confirmed in a cross-sectional study of 21 children. Jill and Peter de Villiers found that children who correctly used the morphemes that Adam, Eve, and Sarah had acquired late were also able to use the ones that Adam, Eve, and Sarah had acquired earlier. The children mastered the morphemes at different ages, just as Adam, Eve, and Sarah had done, but the order of their acquisition was very similar. Many hypotheses have been proposed to explain why these grammatical morphemes are acquired in the observed order. Researchers have studied the frequency with which the morphemes occur in parent speech, the cognitive complexity of the meanings represented by each morpheme, and the difficulty of perceiving or pronouncing them. In the end, there has been no simple satisfactory explanation for the sequence, and most researchers agree that the order is determined by an interaction among a number, a number of factors. To supplement the evidence we have from simply observing children, some carefully designed procedures have been developed to further explore children's knowledge of grammatical morphemes. One of the first and best known is the, is the WUG test developed by John Burko. In this test, children perf performing children performing mysterious actions. Sorry, in this test, children are shown drawings of imaginary creatures with novel names or people performing mysterious actions. For example, they are told, "Here is a wug. Now there are two of them. There are two blank. Or here is a man who knows how to bo to bod." Yesterday, he did the same thing. Yesterday, he blank. By completing these sentences with wugs and botted, 
Children demonstrate that they know the patterns for plural and simple past in English. By generalizing these patterns to words they've never heard before, they show that their language is more than just a list of memorized word pairs, such as book, books, nod, nodded. The acquisition of other language features also shows how children's language develops systematically and how they go beyond what they have heard to create new forms and structures. Negation. Children learn the function of negation very early. That is, they learn to comment on the disappearance of objects, to refuse a suggestion, or to reject an assertion even at the single word stage. However, as Lewis Bloom's longitudinal studies show, even though children understand these functions and express them with single words and gestures, it takes some time before they can express them in sentences, using the appropriate words and word order. The following stages in the development of negation have been observed in the acquisition of English. Similar stages have been observed in other languages as well. Stage 1. Negation is usually expressed by the word no, either all alone or as the first word in the utterance, no, no cookie, no comb hair. Stage 2. Utterances grow longer and the sentence subject may be included. The negative word appears just before the verb. Sentences expressing rejection or prohibition often use don't. Daddy, no comb hair. Don't touch that. Stage 3. The negative element is inserted into a more complex sentence. Children may add forms of the negative other than no, including words like can't and don't. These sentences appear to follow the correct English pattern of attaching the negative to the auxiliary or model verb or modal verb. However, children do not yet vary these forms for different persons or tenses. I can't do it. He don't want it. Stage 4. Children begin to attach the negative elements to the correct form of auxiliary verbs such as do and be. You didn't have supper. She doesn't want it. Even though the language system is by now more complex, they may still have difficulty with some other features related to negatives. I don't have no more candies. Questions. The challenge of learning complex language systems is also illustrated in the developmental stages through which children learn to ask questions. There is remarkable consistency in the way children learn to form questions in English. For one thing, there is a predictable order in which the WH words emerge. What is generally the first WH question word to be used? It is often learned as part of a chunk. Was that? And it is some time before children learn that there are variations of the form, such as what is that and what are these? Where and who emerge very soon. Identifying and locating people and objects are within the child's understanding of the world. Furthermore, adults tend to ask children just these types of questions in the early days of language learning. For example, where is mommy? Or Who's that? Why emerges around the end of the second year and becomes a favorite for the next year or two. Children seem to ask an endless number of questions beginning with why, having discovered how effectively this little word gets adults to engage in conversation. For example, why that lady has blue hair. Finally, when the child has a better understanding of manner and time, how and when emerge. In contrast to what, where, and who questions, children sometimes ask the more cognitively difficult why, when, and how questions without understanding the answers they get, as the following conversation with a four-year-old clearly shows. When can we go outside? In about five minutes. One, two, three, four, five. Can we go now? The ability to use these question words is at least partly tied to children's cognitive development. It is also predicted in part by the questions children are asked and the linguistic complexity of questions with different WH words. Thus, it does not seem surprising that there is consistency in the sequence of their acquisition. Perhaps more surprising is the consistency in the acquisition of word order in questions. This development is not based on learning new meanings, but rather on learning different linguistic patterns to express meanings that are already understood. Stage 1. 
Children's earliest questions are single words or simple two or three word sentences with rising intonation. Cookie, mommy book. At the same time, they may produce some correct questions. Correct because they have been learned as chunks. Where's daddy? What's that? Stage two. As they begin to ask more new questions, children use the word order of the declarative sentence with rising intonation. You like this? I have some. They continue to produce the correct chunk learned forms such as what's that alongside their own created question. Stage three. Children gradually, children notice the structure of questions is different and begin to produce questions such as can I go? Are you happy? Although some questions at the stage match the adult pattern, they may be right for the wrong reason. To describe this, we need to see the pattern from the child's perspective rather than from the perspective of the adult grammar. We call this stage fronting because the child's rule seems to be that questions are formed by putting something, a verb or question, or question word, at the front of a sentence, leaving the rest of the sentence in its statement form. Is the teddy is tired? Do, do I can have a cookie? Why you don't have one? Why you catched it? Stage four. At stage four, some questions are formed by subject auxiliary inversion. The questions resemble those of stage three, but there is more variety in the auxiliary auxiliaries that appear before the subject. Are you going to play with me? At this stage, children can even add do questions in which there would be no auxiliary in the declarative version of the sentence. Do dogs like ice cream? Even at this stage, however, children seem able to use either inversion or a WH word, but not both. For example, is he crying, but not why is he crying? Therefore, we may find an inversion in yes-no questions, but not in WH questions, unless they are formulaic units such as what's that? Stage 5. At stage 5, both WH and yes-no questions are formed correctly. Are these your books? Why did you do that? Does daddy have a box? Negative questions may still be a bit too difficult. Why the teddy bear can't go outside? And even though performance on most questions is correct, there is still one more hurdle. When WH words appear in subordinate clauses or embedded questions, children overgeneralize the inverted form that would be correct for simple questions and produce sentences such as, ask him why he can't he go out. Stage six. At this stage, children are able to correctly form all question types, including negative and complex questions, embedded questions. Passages through developmental sequences do not always follow a steady, uninterrupted path. Children appear to learn new things and then fall back on old patterns when there is added stress in a new situation, or when they are using other new elements in their language. But the overall path takes them towards a closer and closer approximation of the language that is spoken around them. The preschool years. By the age of four, most children can ask questions, give commands, report real events, and create stories about imaginary events using correct word order and grammatical markers most of the time. In fact, it is generally accepted that by age four, Children have acquired the basic structures of the language or languages spoken in, to them in these early years. Three- and four-year-olds continue to learn vocabulary at the rate of several words a day. They also begin to acquire less frequent and more complex linguistic structures, such as passives and relative clauses. Much of the children's language acquisition effort in the late preschool years is spent in developing their ability to use language in a widening social environment. They use language in a greater variety of situations. They interact more often with unfamiliar adults. They begin to talk sensibly on the telephone to invisible grandparents. Younger children do not understand that their telephone partner cannot see what they see. They acquire the aggressive or cajoling language that is needed to defend their toys when playing with other children. 
They show that they had learned the difference between how adults talk to babies and how they talk to each other, and they use this knowledge in elaborate pretend play in which they practice using these different voices. In this way, they explore and begin to understand how and why language varies. In the preschool years, children also begin to develop metalinguistic awareness, the ability to treat language as an object separate from the meaning it conveys. Three-year-old children can tell you that it's silly to say, drink the chair, because it doesn't make sense. However, although they would never say, cake the eat, they are less sure that there's anything wrong with it. They may show that they know it's a bit odd, but they will focus mainly on the fact that they can understand what it means. Five-year-olds, on the other hand, know that drink the chair is wrong in a different way from cake the eat. They can tell you that one is silly, but the other is wrong, is the wrong way around. Language acquisition in the preschool years is impressive. It is also noteworthy that children have spent thousands of hours interacting with language, participating in conversations, eavesdropping on others' conversations, being read to, watching television, etc. A quick mathematical exercise will show just how many hours children spend in language-rich environments. If children are awake, for 10 or 12 hours a day, we may estimate that they are in contact with the language of their environment for 20,000 hours or more by the time they go to school. Although preschool children acquire complex knowledge and skills for language and language use, the school setting requires new ways of using language and brings new opportunities for language development. The school years. In the school years, children's ability to use language to understand others and to express their own meanings expands and grows. Learning to read gives a major boost to metalinguistic awareness. Seeing words represented by letters and other symbols on a page leads children to a new understanding that language has form as well as meaning. Reading reinforces the understanding that a word is separate from the thing it represents. Unlike three-year-olds, who can read, understand that the is a word, just as house is, they understand that caterpillar is a longer word than train, even though the object it represents is substantially shorter. Metalinguistic awareness also includes the discovery of such things as ambiguity. Knowing that words and sentences can have multiple meanings gives children access to word jokes, trick questions, and riddles, which they love to share with their friends and family. One of the most impressive aspects of language development in the school years is the astonishing growth of vocabulary. Children enter school with the ability to understand and produce several thousand words and thousands more will be learned at school. In both the spoken and written language at school, words such as homework or ruler appear frequently in situations where their meaning is either immediately or gradually revealed. Words like population or latitude occur less frequently, but they are made important by their significance in academic subject matter. Vocabulary grows at a rate, at a rate of between several hundred and more than a thousand words a year, depending mainly on how much and how widely children read. The kind of vocabulary growth required for school success is likely to come from both reading for assignments and reading for pleasure whether narrative or nonfiction. D. Gardner suggests that reading a variety of text types is an essential part of vocabulary growth. His research has shown how the range of vocabulary in narrative texts is different from that in nonfiction. There are words in nonfiction texts that are unlikely to occur in story, stories or novels. In addition, nonfiction texts that are unlikely to occur in stories or novels. In addition, sorry, nonfiction tends to include more opportunity to see a word in its different forms. For example, mummy, mummies, mummified. The importance for, of reading for vocabulary growth is seen when observant parents report a child using a new word but mispronouncing it in a way that reveals it has been encountered only in written form. Another important development in the school years is the acquisition of different language registers. Children learn how written language differs from spoken language, how the language used to speak to the principal is different from the language of the playground, 
how the language of a science report is different from the language of a narrative. As Terry Piper and others have documented, some children will have, to have even more to learn if they come to school speaking an entire, speaking an entire, speaking an ethnic or regional variety of the school language that is quite different from the one used by the teacher. They will have to learn that another variety, often referred to as a standard variety, is required for successful academic work. Other children arrive at school speaking a different language altogether. For these children, the work of language learning in the early school years presents additional opportunities and challenges. We will return to this topic when we discuss bilingualism in early childhood. Explain the first language acquisition. These descriptions of language development form from infancy through the early school years shows that we have considerable knowledge of what children learn in their early language development. More controversial, however, are questions about how this development takes place. What abilities does a child bring to the task and what are the contributions of the environment? Since the middle of the 20th century, three main theoretical positions have been advanced to explain language development, behaviorist, innatist, and interactionist slash developmental perspectives. The behaviorist perspective. Behaviorism is a theory of learning that was influential in the 1940s and 1950s, especially in the United States. With regard to language learning, the best known proponent of this psych psychological theory was B.F. Skinner, 1957. Traditional behaviorists <laughs> hypothesized that when children imitated the language produced by those around them, their attempts to reproduce what they heard received positive reinforcement. This could take the form of praise or just successful communication. Thus encouraged by their environment, children would continue to imitate and practice these sounds and patterns until they formed habits of correct language use. According to this view, the quality and quantity of the language a child hears, as well as the consistency of the reinforcement offered by others in the environment, would shape the child's language behavior. This theory gives great importance to the environment as a source of everything the child needs to learn. Analyzing children's speech, definitions, and examples. The behaviors viewed imitation and practice as the primary processes in language development. To clarify what is meant by these two terms, consider the following definitions and examples. Imitation, word for word repetition of all or part of someone else's utterance. Shall we play with the dolls? Play with dolls. Practice. Repetitive manipulation of form. He eat carrots. The other one eat carrots. They both eat carrots. Now examine the transcript from Peter, Cindy, and Catherine. They were all about 24 months old when they were recorded as they played with a visiting adult. Using the definitions above, Notice how Peter imitates the adult in the following dialogue. Peter, 24 months, is playing with a dump truck while two adults, Patsy and Lewis, look on, or Lois. Peter says, get more. Lois says, you're going to put more wheels on the dump truck? Peter says, dump truck, wheels, dump truck. Later, Patsy says, what happened to it? meaning the truck. Peter, looking under the chair for it, says, Lose it. Dump truck. Dump truck. Fall. Fall. Lois. Yes, the dump truck fell down. Dump truck fell down. Dump truck. If we analyze a larger sample of Peter's speech, we would see that 30 to 40 percent of his sentences were imitations of what someone else had just said. We would also see that his imitations were not random. That is, he did not simply imitate 30 to 40% of everything he heard. Detailed analysis of large samples of Peter's speech over about a year showed that he imitated words and sentences, sentence structures that were just beginning to appear in his spontaneous speech. Once these new elements became solidly grounded in his language system, he stopped imitating them and went on to imitate others. 
Unlike a parrot, who imitates the familiar and continues to repeat the same things again and again, children appear to imitate selectively. The choice of what to imitate seems to be based on something new that they have just begun to understand and use, not simply on what is available in the environment. For example, consider how Cindy imitates and practices language in the following conversations. Cindy, aged 24 months, 16 days, is looking at a picture of a carrot in a book and trying to get Patsy's attention. Kewo, 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 kewo. What are the rabbits eating? They eating kando. No, that's a carrot. Carrot. The other carrot. The other carrot. The other carrot. What does this rabbit like to eat? Eat the carrots? He eat carrots. The other one eat carrots. They both eat carrots. One week later, Cindy opens the book to the same page. Here's the carrots. Is that a carrot? Yes. Cindy appears to be working hard on her language acquisition. She practices new words and structures in a way that sounds like a student in some foreign language classes. Perhaps most interesting is that she remembers the language lesson a week later and turns straight to the page in the book she had not seen since Patsy's last visit. What is most striking is that, like Peter, her imitation and practice appear to be focused on what she is currently working on. The samples of speech from Peter and Cindy seem to lend some support to the behaviorist explanation of language acquisition. Even so, as we saw, the choice of what to imitate and practice seemed determined by something inside the child rather than by the environment. Not all children imitate and practice as much as Peter and Cindy did. The amount of imitation in the speech of other children whose development proceeded at a rate comparable to that of Cindy and Peter has been calculated at less than 10%. Consider the examples of imitation and practice in the following conversation between Catherine and Lois. Did you see the toys I brought? I bring toys? Choo-choo? Lois brought the choo-choo train? Yes, Lois brought the choo-choo train. I want to play with choo-choo train. I want to play with choo-choo train. Want play. What's this? Oh, you know what that is. Put down on floor. This. I do this. Taking out two cars of, of trains. Do this. I want do this. Trying to put the trains together. I do this. I do this. Okay, you can do it. You can do it. Look, I'll show you how. I get more. Get a more. No more choo-choo train. Get truck. Catherine truck. Where? Where a more choo-choo train? Look. I'm sorry. Inside. It's in the box. A choo-choo? This is a choo-choo train. Like Cindy, Catherine sometimes repeats herself or produces a series of related practice sentences, but she rarely imitates the other speaker. Instead, she asks and answers questions and elaborates on the other speaker's questions or statements. Thus, children vary in the amount of imitation they do. In addition, many of the things they say show that they are using language creatively, not just repeating what they have heard. This is evident in the following examples. Patterns in language. The first example shows a child in the process of learning patterns in language. In this case, the rules of word formation and overgeneralizing them in to new con them to new contexts. Randall, who's 36 months, had a sore on his hand. Maybe we need to go take you to the doctor. Why? So he can dock my little bump? Randall forms the verb dock from the noun doctor. By analogy with farmers who farm, swimmers who swim, and actors who act. Focus on meaning. Even older children have to work out some puzzles. For example, when familiar language is used in unfamiliar ways, as in the example below. When David, five years old, one month, was at his older sister's birthday party, toasts were proposed with grape juice in stemmed glasses. I'd like to propose a toast. Several minutes later, David raised his glass. I'd like to propose a piece of bread. Only when laughter sent David slinking from the table 
did the group realize that he wasn't intentionally making a play on words. He was concentrating so hard on performing the fascinating new gesture and the formulaic expression, I'd like to propose, dot, 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 that he failed to realize that the word he thought he knew, toast, was not the same toast that could be replaced with his apparent near synonym, a piece of bread. Question formation. Randall, two years, nine months, asked the following questions in various situations over the course of a day. Our dogs can wiggle their tails? Are those are my boots? Are this is hot? Randall had concluded that the trick of asking questions was to put are at the beginning of the sentence. His questions are good examples of stage three in question development. Order of events. Randall, three years, five months, was looking for a towel. You took all the towels away because I can't dry my hands. He meant I can't dry my hands because you took all the towels away, but he made a mistake about which clause comes first. Children at this stage of language development tend to mention events in the order of their occurrence. In this case, the towels disappeared before Randall attempted to dry his hands, so that's what he said first. He did not yet understand how a word like before or because changes the order of cause and effect. These examples of children's speech provide us with a window on the process of language learning. Imitation and practice alone cannot explain some of the forms created by children. They are not merely repetition of sentences that they have heard from adults. Rather, children appear to pick out patterns and generalize them to new contexts. They create new forms or new uses of words. Their new sentences are usually comprehensible and often correct. Behaviorism seems to offer a reasonable way of understanding how children learn some of the regular and routine aspects of learning, especially at the earliest stages. However, children who do little overt imitation acquire language as fully and rapidly as those who imitate a lot. And although behaviorism goes some way to explain the sorts of overgeneralization that children make, it is not a satisfactory explanation for the acquisition of the more complex grammar that children acquire. These limitations led researchers to look for a different explanation for language acquisition.